Okay, so thank you so much to PyData for inviting me, and thank you all for staying on a Sunday afternoon to look at some pictures and projects the artists are doing in this field. Let me just get my slides up. Yeah, so as uh, Cecilia mentioned, I look at this field of creative AI, and uh, I run the Creative AI Meetup here in London. I sometimes dabble in uh, creating art myself, and I create exhibitions and uh, research what startups and corporates are doing in this space. And um, today I'm going to give you an overview of uh, how various uh, machine and deep learning techniques are used in, in the field of art. And I'm mainly sticking to visual art because that's my uh, preferred form. And um, if you look at uh, the mainstream interest in the space, I think it really kicked off with, uh, with Deep Dream, which uh, came out of Google about three years ago. And I trust most of you are familiar with this, but if you're not, here is an image of an artist called Memo Acton. And you can see how his uh, photograph transforms into this image with uh, lots of multicolored dogs and pagodas because the neural network works to emphasize the features in, in the image. And other artists such as Mike Tyker have uh, created work in the space and also Daniel Ambrosi who actually combined the techniques of Deep Dream with uh, computational photography. So you can see that uh, the images they're still somewhat realistic and kind of very high quality, but uh, the deep dream uh, swirls are still visible. And then came the technology of style transfer, which uh, Jean has done a lot of work in. So kind of playing around with how you can uh, transform a Mona Lisa painting into a cubist or a pointillist artwork or even look at how you can change it into the style of Google Maps or kind of calligraphy. So yes, yeah, style transfer has been very popular in the technical community, I think. But uh, the artistic um, field sees it a little bit differently. <laughs> yeah, they're a little bit wary of it in some ways and um, so whenever I actually talk to curators or computer um, or computational creativity researchers in, 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 this, in this space, they're always complaining that they're in the technical community. There is so much interest in playing around with style transfer and apps such as Prisma to create um, aesthetical, to create work that is aesthetically pleasing but there is kind of little novelty or meaning in it from the art side. So that's kind of sometimes their perspective. But uh, I think there are many ways how you can interestingly use the ideas of style transfer, particularly if you move beyond the, if you move beyond kind of this impressionist or pointless aesthetic to something like Jean's examples here of using, um, Google Maps or of combining styles. And um, moving on, there is a, there's an artist called Terence Broad who reconstructed um, the film uh, Blade Runner frame by frame using a variational autoencoder. So um, you can see the reconstructed version on the right. And uh, it reconstructs some um, some parts of the film better than others, but still is uh, somewhat far from perfect. But either way, uh, this work got a copyright infringement notice from Warner Brothers when it was put up online. So it's quite interesting that this shows that clearly that the algorithm used by Warner Brothers to detect uh, fakes and uh, pirate artworks up online uh, decided that this kind of um, that this work, which is 
still quite blurry to my eye, and I wouldn't want to watch Blade Runner like this as a film, that it still uh, was pretty much like a pirate or a copy in their eyes. Um, there's another artist called Ben Bogart who trained uh, a different type of uh, model on, uh, um, yeah, on, on Blade Runner still. And I think this was uh, yeah, some statistical methods. And uh, yeah, you can see it's much more angular. And uh, in aesthetics, quite different to what uh, Terry Broad has done. And then if we think of um, artists uh, looking at identity or the human form, then uh, uh, generative adversarial networks have provided plenty of opportunities for artists to kind of play around with this technology. And uh, one of the more popular artists is Mario Klingemann, who on a day-to-day -day basis very much experiments with the latest models to generate various images. So I particularly like these ones because they are reminiscent to perhaps early 20th century painting. And whenever I speak to my art world colleagues, they see Francis Bacon or Egon Schiele or other artists as being an inspiration for this work. But if you ask Mario Klingemann, he will say that no, he didn't think of these artists. All he did was kind of plug in a database, a database of, um, I think this was unsuitable for work um, images. <laughs> and then he got these kind of weird forms that are clearly very, very reminiscent of the human form, but not quite perfect. And the same with, uh, with these images where the eye or, or the mouth can be lopsided. And uh, some of his further experiments also, um, also include kind of black and white versions. And artists such as uh, Mike Tyke have also done work which is uh, kind of much more, um, much more realistic and probably similar to what you can now get with, uh, I think it was Celebgan that came out from NVIDIA that can generate lots of images of uh, celebrity faces. And now I wanted to give you a couple of examples of artists who work with their own data sets. So um, these artists, starting with uh, Roman Lipsky, they actually made their own data sets. So Roman Lipsky took uh, lots of photos of um, yeah, various scenery in uh, Los Angeles. And uh, then he, he trained uh, Convnet to generate kind of images from that based on his style. And I think these are some of the paintings from Roman Lipsky. And this is what uh, the neural network has been generating. Kind of, and then this later on as, uh, as Roman Lipsky has been plugging in some of his, gener some of his uh, drawings into the kind of neural network to generate further images. And then he drew these again. So these are the generated images, and this is one of his drawings. So I think this is interesting because, um, yeah, it's, it's an example of an artist who is kind of thinking about the, the importance of data and how you can influence that in um, kind of creating a future work, and then also what it uh, teaches you and inspires you to do with your own practice. And um, there is also an artist called uh, Anna Riddler who, who watched this film called Fall of the House of Usher. And it's a 1929 black and white film based on an Edgar Allan Poe book. And um, Anna made 300 ink drawings, like seen um, here, um, based on, on the film. And then she um, 
Yeah, she used pix to pix so one of these GAN models to generate images in her style. And this is, this is kind of the generated animation. And um, I've, I know Anna very well, and I always kind of ask her about this project. And she tells me that for her, it was an interesting experiment to see what uh, the pix to pix generates from her work and what this tells her about her own practice. So, for example, she has now noted that there are certain objects that she forgets in images. So there's, I think, a chair that appears and reappears sometimes in the sequence because to her it's not important, and sometimes she forgets it. And then in, 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 the, in the face, sometimes she draws the eyes and the eyebrows very similarly. And this is also obvious in the results of what the neural network has generated. And then there is an artist called uh, Patrick Tresse who has this robot that uh, draws images of people. And I think he accumulated a data set of maybe 10 or 20,000 drawings. It's uh, quite a lot. And then uh, 21,000 drawings. And then he got pix to pix to generate some images of kind of faces back from these drawings. And there is this, I always forget how to pronounce it, but there's this type of um, art uh, <laughs> that, um, that, that yeah, can, can also uh, can also be used to feed into the neural networks and then generate images that are uh, completely kind of uh, joined and clear. And these were done by Osamu Aku Akiyama. And now if we look at uh, artistic projects that think more about recognizing and classifying images, there is this Tate IK prize which uh, compares a contemporary photojournalism, so that's the image on the left, to uh, photos from the Tate collection. And yeah, there are some examples where you can see the inside of a kind of BMW car is compared to a Henry Moore sculpture. Or you have an image of kind of somebody sitting in front of a screen compared to a scholar. So there are a couple of uh, interesting um, comparisons that kind of you, you might initially not expect to see. And there is an artist and researcher called uh, Tom White uh, who used, uh, yeah, who, who, who created uh, images that uh, pass as certain categories um, according to various uh, models. And um, so it says here, this is not a sewing machine, but this image passed as a sewing machine in uh, Inception V3, VGG16, and, and other models. So it's kind of uh, showing how the machine's eye can recognize it as a sewing machine, whereas to a human, it's like not a sewing machine. And this is an example of an, of an electric fan. Kind of same, again, recognizes an electric fan in all these kind of various models. And then there is an artist called uh, Georgia Ward Dyer who drew various uh, images um, in a kind of calligraphy style. And then... Um, yeah, pass them through an image recognition model to figure out what they can be recognized as. And this is an example of a fountain, uh, for example. So uh, in this image, one of the models saw a fountain, and on the right are the kind of the features or the points in an image that made the network think it is a fountain. And this is a street sign. So uh, in George's case, it was interesting to see how these um, neural networks derive meaning from these random characters and how they can also create something that is, in, in general, an, an essence of 
a street sign, so the minimum kind of components you need for something to be a street sign. And um, there is this work by uh, Sebastian Schmieg, which looks at how you classify images into various categories, including the past and the future, and the problem and the solution. So these images, for example, uh, they were um, noted by visitors of the website as uh, belonging to the category of problem. So you see you have children, you have nuclear power stations, and things like that. For the solution, you have parrots and uh, Arts Council England. If you think about the past, you have ice cream, you have trees and sofas. And for the future, you have children and people with guns and, um, yeah, logo t-shirts. And then there are some artists who think more about the processes involved in creating art and how AI and machine learning can be involved in that. So Harm van den Dorpel used genetic algorithms to try and come up with uh, a supreme artwork. So he has this website where uh, there are various turtle drawings that are being generated. And he has two parent artworks that generate lots of children artworks. And then the viewer then kind of chooses which one to keep and then kind of continue the process. And in the end, when all the generated artworks are very similar, the, the final artwork is then kept and can be printed into a real 3D artwork. It's kind of this process of um, a narrowing down the options to come up with the best supreme artwork. So that's some of his work of the potential options that are generated. Um, and then there is uh, Nicolas Maigret and Maria Roskowska, who have this art project called Predictive Art Bot. And this is a Twitter bot that generates uh, concepts for artworks, such as this one. A feminist land art piece divulging classified information about online dating, or a post-internet malware to materialize the bias of whistleblowers. So all these kind of... Uh, semi-random concepts, but uh, if you're from the art world, you realize that these actually can become real, re real works of art. And um, what uh, the artists behind this project wanted to do is they got um, the machine to generate the concept, and then the artists were supposed to realize that. And uh, there were some projects where the artist made, I think, various videos according to kind of the, the title, but um, they, they, they were somewhat less interesting. Um, I don't know how many of you are into like 3D printing and stuff, but there is this website called Thingiverse that um, has various 3D designs that you can print. And the artist, uh, Julien Desueff and Matt Plummer Fernandez, they created a bot called Shiv Integer that creates mashups of various projects. So here you, oh, so yeah, for example, this is one of these mashups. It's called an open overload nozzle. And you can see that it's a weird object that you probably would never come up with yourself. But hey, that's what the bot does by combining various designs. And to me, it was interesting to see the feedback from uh, the community because there was, there was this bot that kept creating these designs and on the news feed, they kind of kept coming up and some people were not sure if it was done by a human who maybe needed to communicate in some way. Others were complaining that it was quite spammy and yeah, others were just remarking that it was strange or it helped them. And in the end, this culminated in an exhibition in the Netherlands where all these uh, generated works were printed. And then people could vote whether this is art or spam. <laughs> I 
and it's mainly voted as art, but that's maybe because people who go to art galleries do like art. I don't know. <laughs> Spam, okay, well, and then if we think about um, kind of some of the critical art done with AI, then uh, I often think of an artist called Constant Dullard, who worked with, um, with a technologist to do the opposite of Deep Dream. So Deep Dream emphasizes the features in an image, like we saw in the beginning, and uh, this dull dream, it reduces the features in an image. So you can see this is quite blurry, and the same with Trump. <laughs> and Constant Dillard wanted to show here how we as individuals can kind of regain control of our privacy and make ourselves a little bit less uh, recognizable by kind of reducing features. And I don't know if you saw this. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, this probably needs a little explanation, but Scott Kelly and Ben Polkinghorne decided that it's good to comment on the way we are kind of obsessed with uh, our online lives and searching for recommendations. So why not put up boards like this in New Zealand so that people know <coughs> where else they might want to go while still in this beautiful natural environment? And while you're on a beach, you can go to some other beaches. When you're on a playground, you can go to McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, so I quite like this. And then if, if we're still thinking about the theme of um, kind of privacy and hiding away from these uh, computer vision and, image and facial recognition systems, then the artist Adam Harvey created a work called CV Dazzle. And um, yeah, this work shows what you can do, or what you can kind of put on your face to make yourself unrecognizable as a face to some of these models. And I think these are a little bit out of date because of course um, the technologies keep being updated, but it's interesting that at one point if you put something on your cheeks, you no longer became a face, or if you had these, um, <laughs> kind of weird hairstyles. Yeah, and um, finally, I wanted to look at some projects that uh, imagine what art or living in a, in a world with AI would look like. So there is uh, Ian Cheng that has an emissaries uh, trilogy uh, that is a kind of a live simulation of various kind of actors existing in this uh, space. And there is, ooh, there is Lawrence Leck, who made uh, a film called Geomancer that is set in a Singapore of, um, uh, I think, 2050, and is about a satellite AI that wants to become an artist. And um, yeah, so when, when creating this film, Lawrence used uh, Terry Broad and his um, variational autoencoder to generate a dream sequence in the film. So the original film was done in this kind of game engine style, and this is a shot from the dream sequence that is also kind of, can, can be seen here. And yeah, this is to show that this is maybe what an AI of the future dreams like. This is what it kind of sees or visualizes. Um, yeah, and then there is um, an artist called Jake Elves who, um, who has this artwork called Closed Loop. And he has two models. So one is a captioning model. So I think it's the one on the right. And it tries to come up with a caption for what it sees on the left. And then the, the model on the left, it tries to generate an image based on the caption. So it's like two AIs talking to each other. And if you watch this for a long period of time, you will see that it gets stuck in, I don't know, either a color or some sort of um, animal thematic. So in this case, it's, there's a lot of blue and birds. 
Artists such as Helen Knowles are thinking about some of the legal and ethical implications of uh, living with AI. And what Helen Knowles did is she came up with, um, with a fictional scenario of, um, um, of when there was this um, kind of algorithm that suggested that students uh, take some sort of, take part in, in uh, medical experiments and then uh, one or two of those students died and then the algorithm that suggested this was put on trial. And um, so H Helen Knowles filmed this trial and you could also uh, experience it as a performance if you went to the gallery as a viewer. So she had a combination of computer scientists, lawyers and other kind of individuals relevant to the field discuss it. And I think it's, uh, it's always quite um, curious what, what, this, what, 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 dis what the discussions come out to. And I think the results were different depending on whether it was kind of live or recorded. Um, and then there is uh, Pina Yoldas who has a work called The Kitty AI that is, um, yeah, that is about an AI that becomes the first um, governor of uh, the planet and it's represented as a cat. It's a talking cat that talks about the future and the inevitability of um, kind of being unable to resist the various problems our human society faces. And yeah, if you want to see more of uh, more AI-based artworks, then uh, you can go to this website called nipsforcreativity.com. And there are about 50 different works submitted to the NIPS workshop I organized last year. And if you happen to be in Leicester, I'm organizing a short AI and art um, festival there for the next two weeks. And we have a couple of installations and some talks, yeah, including the, the Kitty AI installation. And um, yeah, if you're doing some research in the area or if you're experimenting with these tools, then you should come or submit to our Computer Vision for Fashion Art and Design Workshop, which is going to happen as part of uh, a European conference on computer vision in uh, Munich on the 14th of September. So we don't have an official open call yet, but uh, keep an eye out for it. And yeah, here are my contact details if you want to reach out and if you have an artwork or anything you'd like to call to my attention. Any questions? Any questions? Aha. Yeah, thank you. It was super, super interesting. Uh, I have two questions. First one, uh, this is like a good example of that, but what is the criticism of people in art about this new direction of AI in art? Mm -hmm. Second one, what, for example, if I want to do something like that, how can I find funding to basically buy food and like, what is the, the way to, to monetize these things? Okay, yeah, so two very good questions. So number one is kind of how, I guess, the art world perceives it. And um, that really depends. So I think recently the art world uh, started to become very interested in this topic of AI, well, like everybody else, right? So there were a number of exhibitions looking at the topic, but most of these exhibitions focus more on the ethical d dimensions um, of the topic. So um, I showed this artist, Adam Harvey or Constant Dullard, who think about the privacy and kind of hiding from this, I don't know, surveillance or facial recognition algorithms. So I think a lot of the works that are appreciated by the art community, they are those that are a bit kind of critical of this uh, 
system and the role the technology companies play in our world. Um, and yeah, a lot of the artists I mentioned here, they're not always recognized by the art world because um, sometimes the art world thinks that there should be more of a focus on um, kind of meaning and uh, more of a critical kind of thinking about this technology. Um, but yeah, I think sometimes that is changing and artists such as Mario Klingemann, uh, Jake Elves and Anna Riddler, I have seen their work exhibited in various uh, museum exhibitions. And to answer your second point, so how do you get funding? Uh, I think today I tweeted there was, that there's a museum in Shanghai that is doing a three month fellowship for artists who want to come and kind of work on an AI-based project. And I think in general, you have to look for grants or kind of open calls that are released by various museums and related institutions. So I also know Google Arts and Culture, they had a fellowship and, and an open call for that a few months back. And although these do keep coming up, it's not kind of too frequent and generally there is a lot of competition also from uh, established artists. So probably one of the best ways of kind of getting into this field is starting out kind of as a hobbyist and submit and keep submitting your work kind of online just to Twitter and then also to the various kind of open calls that for example I run with NIPS or ECCV because that will increase your visibility and um, yeah, I probably suggest funding the art through some of your other work. <laughs> well, there is no money in art, so <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I actually want to question that because the commercial art world is huge. Mm -hmm. And it has been a challenge for digital artists ever since the 60s to mm -hmm. engage with the commercial art world. And mm -hmm. what would be an example of, a, of an organization or artists who are really successful at engaging with the commercial art world? Um, and in terms of the commercial art world, how do you define that for you? For me, that's the art that's being well sold, meaning the gallery and the okay. space. Okay. Okay. Um, which is dominated by traditional materials, but things are changing. Hopefully, one day. Well, okay, yeah, so if you do kind of look at the... Yeah, the commercial side of the art world with kind of your yeah, galleries, auction houses, then I think there are various projects for selling kind of digital art. But um, in general, it is tricky. And I, like off the top of my head, I can't really think of many artists who, uh, who have been particularly successful in that. And I think there are, of course, various artists such as Ryoji Ikeda who might create various installations and performances and once kind of, they become big names that way, they're paid a lot for commissions. But in actually kind of selling digital art, I, I do think it's tricky. Any final question? Yep, yeah, one more. Yeah, thank you. That was uh, interesting. Uh, so I have a question a bit different. You didn't really mention about, uh, I'm curious how artists manage to actually use like deep learning, like, because I guess some of them at least don't really know so much about like software or like mm -hmm. uh, machine learning. So like, how do they use those tools? Like, because do they use it as a black box? Do they sometimes try to understand a bit more? Because even machine learners sometimes don't understand them. So I was a bit interested into the tool aspect and how they use the tool for this kind of artworks you, you presented? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, this depends on, uh, on the artist. So I presented you like, with a variety of examples, and I would say there are probably uh, three main categories. So in the first category, you might have people such as Memo Acton, 
who uh, play around with uh, these tools and yet they also work on developing some of these models and can yeah, tweak them very easily themselves and they, they publish in the top conferences as well. Then on the other side of the spectrum you have um, artists who are curious about the space such as Anna Riddler or Georgia Watt Dyer and uh, they, they, for example, they take one of Jean's, Jean Kogan's machine learning for art workshops. So they know kind of the basics of the technology, but yeah, it is mostly a black box for them initially, and then they might start kind of uh, developing the knowledge further, but uh, they are far from developing their own models. So they do sometimes ask for assistance. And then in the middle, you have uh, people such as uh, Constant Dullart and Lawrence Leck, who work with uh, technologists such as Adam Harvey or Terence Broad to uh, create or to add an element of uh, what well, created by, uh, by, by deep learning technology into the artwork that is often a bit more kind of conceptually heavy. So that's how I would categorize it. Any final question? Nope. One more. Last one. Where was that hand? Hey, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, so you talked about the, the art from the point of view of the artist. What do you think of the blurring of the artist tool boundary and where do you think that's headed or what's, what's the general consensus on that in the art community? Um, whether the AI here is an artist or a tool? Yes. So I think in general it is a tool. And in, yeah, in my view and from speaking to many of the artists, it's just really the media that likes to write that AI created I don't know, the first drawing in this particular category or made some other achievement because that's kind of what gets uh, clicks, right? And that's what the media want. But if you do talk to artists, then, um, I mean, yeah, th th then you see that uh, the, yeah, 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 the, the deep learning techniques are used as a tool, right? Because you decide that, oh, you want to use this particular model then you pick your data set, then you kind of tweak the parameters and figure out kind of what you want your generated output to look like. And then finally you also curate it, right? So I think the human is still too involved into the various stages of the process for it to be purely called AI art, kind of as, a, as, kind of, as done by AI completely. Thank you very much for that wonderful talk and the insight into AI and art. And um, please give, about, give it up for Luba.